Dwight L. Moody was the Billy Graham of the 1800s. When he went all over the country preaching and in evangelistic uh, crusades, he many times would make this quote to his audience. Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. As I said, he loved to quote those, to those sentences in, in a way of shocking his audiences with the truth that death is not the end of it all. Uh, death is not the end of his life. It's only the beginning. Well, his words came true on December the 22nd, 19, 1899. On a Friday morning, after decades of nonstop preaching, and writing and speaking and evangelizing and traveling all over this nation, his heart finally began to fail. And with his family gathered around his bedside, he said these words, Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. His family writes that they thought he was dreaming. But then he spoke to one of his sons. He said, this is no dream, Will. It is beautiful. It's like a trance. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me. And I must, I must go. Then it seemed as if heaven literally opened up before his eyes. And he said, this is my triumph. This is my coronation day. I've been looking forward to it for years. Then his face lit up. He said, Dwight, Irene, I see the children's faces. He was speaking of his two grandchildren who had died the year before. A few minutes later, he took his last breath. And thus, D.L. Moody entered into heaven. He died as he lived, full of faith and ready to meet his Lord. Heaven is real. Amen. Well, three of you believe me. Heaven is real. Amen. And I want to go. Amen. Because the Bible tells you so. That's right. It does. The Bible does tell us. You know, most people don't have any problem at all believing in heaven. Uh, even little children believe in heaven, even though their ideas are somewhat a little bit mixed up. Many of them think it's some kind of some sort of celestial amusement park where they'll be eating ice cream and riding Ferris wheels all day long. Others think it's just going to be a one long, boring church service. You know? Um, one seven-year-old boy, though, spoke, and when he spoke, he really spoke for a lot of adults. His quote, that we were talking to before church about Art Link letters, children say the darnest things. This would have fit in that category. He said, I know what heaven is, but I don't want to go there. I want to go to North Carolina instead. <laughs> you know, many of us may say the same thing. We, we know what heaven is real, but we'd rather go to North Carolina. We'd rather go to Florida. We'd rather to go to Hawaii. We'd rather go somewhere. Even Hank Williams Jr. had a mega country hit titled, If Heaven Ain't a Lot Like Dixie, I Don't Want to Go. You know, it's, it, heaven can wait as far as we're concerned. I want to go, but I don't want to go today. But that attitude, as common as it may be, reflects a complete reversal of the biblical picture. The earth is passing away. It is here today and is gone tomorrow. Heaven, which sometimes seems just like a fairy tale, is the true reality. And heaven is the heart's true home. The book of Revelation teaches us more about heaven than any other book in the Bible. Now we're all familiar with Revelation uh, description of heaven that we find in, in Revelation 21 and 22. But right here in, in Revelation chapter 5, we'll find another picture of heaven. So if you haven't already done so, take your Bible and open to Revelation chapter 5. In these first 14 verses, the Apostle John gives us a tantalizing picture of our eternal home. Here we discover that the cross of Christ will still be our focus throughout all of eternity. All of heaven centers around Jesus, the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. 
So today, as we look at Revelation chapter 5, let's look at the various pictures that we see of Jesus. Well, we're going to start in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Read with me. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly. Because no one was worthy to open the book or to even look into it. So here we are. We see the place. We're in the throne room of heaven. We see the time. Sometime in eternity. We see the setting. A magnificent throne and a mysterious scroll. Around the throne are myriads of angelic creatures, glorious and awesome to behold. A bright rainbow encircles the throne. Twenty-four elders wearing crowns of gold surround the throne. Flashes of lightning frame the one that's seated there. A sea of glass surrounds the throne. Everywhere there is singing and worship and praise. Your eye darts from one detail to another. You notice the four living creatures and wonder who they are and what they represent. There are armies of angels on every hand. They are cherubim, seraphim, and other angels that you cannot identify. There is smoke and incense and light and joy. Your eyes and your ears cannot take it all in. Its beauty is beyond our ability to comprehend. Holy, 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 cry the four living creatures. And suddenly, spontaneously, gladly, excitedly, you find yourself bowing down in worship before the throne. You have finally reached heaven. You are in the presence of God Almighty Himself. Nothing you heard or saw or imagined here on earth prepared you for this moment. As much as we know about heaven, we don't even know the half of it, and it's so far more glorious than we could ever imagine. But now, at last, you're home. Home where you belong. At home with the Lord. But after a few moments, your eyes begin to focus on that scroll in the hand of him who sits on the throne. What is that scroll? It appears to be a long parchment written on the front and on the back, sealed with wax. And while you ponder the scroll and wonder what it means, as we just read, an angel cries out, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? There is silence in heaven. No one steps forward. No one in the universe is worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. What a strange sight this is. A scroll no one can open. And like John, we began to weep. Then one of the elders speaks up. Read what he says in verse 5. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome as to open the book and its seven seals. Judah was the tribe that which was prophesied long ago in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come from. The lion of the tribe of Judah speaks of its greatest son who combines with his own being power, wisdom, majesty, and ultimate regal authority. He's also called the root of David, a term meaning that he is a direct descendant of David, Israel's greatest king. But who is this lion who is also called the root of David? Look in verse 6. He said, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. 
as you look at that great throne, a lamb stands in the center, center of the angelic creatures and his 24 elders. But it's not an ordinary lamb. This lamb has been offered as a sacrifice. But he is standing, which means he is alive. But he appears to have been slain, which means he was once dead. The lamb bears on his body the marks of death. But he is alive. The Greek word for lamb is used 29 times in the book of Revelation. It's only used one other time throughout the rest of the New Testament. It means a young or small lamb, exactly the kind that was always used as a sacrifice by the Jews for centuries upon centuries. In the Old Testament, the lamb is on the altar. In the Gospels, the lamb is on the cross. But in the book of Revelation, the lamb is on the throne. John saw him at the center of the throne because the lamb stands at the center of God's plan for redemption. So as you watch and as you wonder, the Lamb comes to the throne and takes the scroll from the one who sits on it. He can do this because even though he was once dead, he has come back to life. Look at verse 7. And he came, and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9. Well, if it'll turn. And they sang a new song. Worthy are thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. The silence in heaven is broken as millions of angels begin to sing. Verse 11, And I heard and I saw the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then as, as if answering in chorus, all of the universe begins to sing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, the blessing and honor and glory dominion forever and ever. You fall on your face, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Folks, we're going to heaven because of a lamb. We just sang about it, what he's done for me. What, the, what that lamb was slain was for me and for you. The lamb who, slain, who was slain now stands in victory and all of heaven rejoices. Sin has been defeated. The enemy has failed. Redemption is complete and the Lamb has prevailed. That's something to shout about, folks. And that's what we're going to be doing all of eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. This description of heaven comes from Revelation 5. The center of the action is a scroll with seven seals. When the seven seals are opened, they bring forth various judgments on the earth. When the seventh seal is opened, it contains seven trumpets of judgment. When the seventh trumpet sounds, it brings forth seven bowls of judgment. The seals, the trumpets, and the bowls describe the end time catastrophes that will come upon the earth in the last days just prior to the return to the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. As one age dies in agony, Another age is born. Now the book of Revelation nowhere precisely identifies the scroll. During the Roman Empire, 
deeds or contracts were often sealed with seven seals. This included marriage contracts, this included rental and lease agreements, this included contract bills, putting it all in our language. Uh, so many biblical scholars think that perhaps this is the title deed to the earth. The seals, the trumpets, and the bowls describe the events that prepare the earth to receive its rightful owner. If so, if all that's true, then what was lost by Adam when he sinned has now been reclaimed and redeemed by Jesus Christ. The Apostle John, in describing this great scene, mentions three realms in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Yet no one was found worthy to open the scroll. No angel could open it. No earthly ruler could open it. No demon could open it. Not even Satan himself could open it. But Jesus can. Jesus can and Jesus did. The lamb who was slain is now the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has triumphed over death and hell and all the forces Satan could throw against him. Only a worthy victor could take the scroll and open it. He has fought the battle. He has won the fight. Now the spoils of war belong to him. Stop and think about this great point. The Lamb has already won the battle. It's over. He won. The victory is His. And from God's point of view, Satan is already defeated. So let me ask you a question. Who is greater? Today, who is greater, Satan or Jesus? Satan tried to kill Jesus when he was born. He tempted him in the wilderness. He entered Judas and caused him to betray Christ. The evil rulers plotted against Christ. And finally, they nailed him to the cross. A party broke out in hell, singing, shouting, loud cheering, laughing. The Son of God had finally been defeated. Jesus is dead. And in heaven, there's an awful silence. But on that Easter Sunday morning, three days later, something happened inside that tomb. In the place where death reigned, a tiny sound, a movement, a deep sigh, a fluttering heart. Blood begins to flow through the veins. The color returns. Fingers begin to move. Then the arms and legs. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stood up, fully alive, and walked out of that tomb. Down in hell, shock, silence. All of the wild screams of sh shrieks of terror, wailing, no mourning, gnashing of teeth in heaven and across the universe. The people of God began to cheer. The angels lifted their voices. The trumpets began to sound. All of creation shouts the good news. Jesus Christ is alive and has come back from the dead. Let me ask you, since Easter was last Sunday, how many, how many people have you told that Jesus is alive? He is alive today. He will be alive forever and ever. And that is what we are celebrating. Jesus, the Lamb who became a lion. If you're following Satan, you're following a defeated foe. He's smarter than you are. He's prettier than you are. He's slyer than you are. He's more crafty than any of us. But he is defeated. If you follow Jesus, you're following the greatest winner history has ever recorded. He's the undisputed champion. He took on the pretender and knocked him out cold. That's what Revelation 5 says. And that's what it means when it says that Jesus has triumphed. He won the battle. The victory is his. He alone is worthy to open the scroll and break the seven seals. So who is this lion who is a lamb? He stands because he's alive from the dead. He bears on his body all the marks of death and all the marks of his suffering. He is none 
another than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is a lion in the fact that He is the mighty King of kings. He is a lamb because He was offered up as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. So who is Jesus? He is... Oh, come on. He is a meek lamb. He is a mighty lion. Christ the lion is victorious because Christ the lamb made the perfect sacrifice. The lamb speaks of his first coming. The lion, that's just misprint, the lion speaks of his second coming. That, think of that, what all that means. That means he came the first time in humility. He comes the second time with power. He experienced shameful treatment the first time. He comes the second time in great glory. He was crucified like a criminal in his first coming. He returns as judge of the universe. He came... He, was, he came once as a lamb offered for the sins of the world. He comes again as a lion to judge the world and deliver his people. The key verse in all of this is verse 7 of Revelation 5. When the Lamb takes the scroll from him who sits on the throne, this signals that his victory is complete and that history's final events are about to unfold. From this point on, the Lamb is in control of all the events that take place in heaven and on earth. All the rest of Revel the book of Revelation follows from this one symbolic gesture. Although the Antichrist will have his day, the Lamb still holds the, crone, the, the scroll. It will never leave his hands. <clears throat> so all of life is in God's hands. You know, in this torn up, broken world we live in, all sorts of tragedies take place. And usually when the tragedies take place, whether they're man-made or whether they are what we call natural disasters, the most common question is, where was God while this was going on? Where was God when the world was falling apart? Where was God when the mass shooting took place? Where was God when a tsunami or a hurricane or an earthquake ravaged a certain part of the earth? You know where he was? Right where he's supposed to be, sitting on his throne. He's on the throne. Nothing escapes his gaze. He's watching over every event that takes place. He, lo he watches every detail of life. When the world seems to be falling apart, he's holding the scroll. While the nations rise up against one another, he's holding the scroll. While armies march toward Armageddon, he holds the scroll. <clears throat> So in the midst of perplexing situations, in the midst of all sorts of circumstances, especially when we can't understand why, let this thought bring you hope. A lamb holds the scroll in his hand. And he is on the throne. He determines the destiny of all the nations. Everything, even the most despicable evil, is under his control. He is the Lamb and the Lion. But Jesus is also Lord of all. There's a short course in theology in verses 9 and 10. Let's go back to it. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased from God every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign upon the earth. When Christ died, his death had a definite purpose. His, his blood, his death purchased a great host of men and women for God. Jesus came as God's purchasing agent to the earth. He searched through every tribe, every nation, every continent, every country, every state, every province, every city, every village. He went up and down every street looking for people, looking for men and women he might purchase for God. And today he still continues to do that. Let us not put aside 
what He has done for us. But let us do put aside any non-Christian thinking that our Lord is going to be defeated. Yes, we're living in a world that seems to be getting worse and worse by the moment. Yes, we're living in a world where evil seems to be triumphing. We're living in a world where good is now considered evil and what was once evil is now considered good. But do not be confused for a moment and think that Jesus is being defeated. He said all of this would be happening as we approach that moment when Gabriel blows the trumpet, Michael clears his throat and yells, and we're going home. Jesus is the Lord of all. He is the glory of heaven. Turn back to our text. And after hearing all of this and seeing all this, look at the response in verse 14. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The glory of heaven is the Lamb. Jesus Christ, whose victory is celebrated without end. John saw the Lamb standing in the center of the throne. Jesus is the focal point of heaven, and He is the center of all attention. Without Jesus, there would be no heaven at all. And without Him, none of us would have a chance of going there. But we are. We do. We have that opportunity because Jesus died and rose again. He descended into hell and He snatched the keys and for once and for all made the sacrifice that you and I needed so that if we will just trust and believe in Him, we can have that eternal life. Not maybe, not hope so, not wishful thinking. We can know that we have eternal life. So let me ask you a personal question. Do you know this moment that if you died in the next second, you're going to heaven? Because you can know that. And if you know that you know that, then you have the blessed assurance that we sing about. If you don't know that, you can have it today. Jesus offers it to you. He simply holds it out to you as a free gift. And in faith, you reach up and receive it. If you're not sure, today is the day to draw a line in the sand. And say, I may have been saved in the past. I don't know. It may have been real. It may not have been. But I know today it is real. Today I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Raised from the dead. For the forgiveness of my sins. Jesus is the glory of heaven. You know, I think it would do all of us good. At least, at least once every year. To come back and reread. Chapter 5 of Revelation. And contemplate that wonderful scene that's opened up for all of us. I think we'd, if we did, we'd be less prone to complain. We'd be less tempted to give up. And we'd be less tempted to dabble in the things of the world. One final word. The glory of heaven is Jesus. As long as the ages roll on, we will never, ever, ever tire of singing His praise. What the song say? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. That's, that's our King. That's our Savior. That's our Lord. 
So on that day when we get there, when we see the, the, the Lord Himself open up these seals, open up that scroll, on that day we will see Him bearing the marks of His suffering on our behalf. And we will hear the redeemed saints of God. We will join in as the redeemed saints of God and sing with one united voice the praise. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown Him Lord of all. Let that song begin in your heart this very day. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? Then let's go live for Him. Father God, our prayer is quite simple. We say thank You for what You have done for us through, through the person of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank You for the sacrifice He made. We thank You that He and He alone is worthy Worthy to open the scroll, open the seals, worthy to judge, worthy to love, worthy to save. We pray, Lord, that every day we will live in a way that brings honor and glory to you. For you are King of kings and Lord of lords. May we cause you ever, ever to be ashamed. Be our King, be our Lord, be our Savior, be our God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May I spend however many years I have left on this earth, whether it be just a day or two, or whether it be decades, Let me live for you and give all glory and praise to you. For this is my prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. And as God is speaking to you, if you want to come to the altar and pray, you do so. After all, Jesus paid it all.
my soul to say, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all. Some stain he washed it white as snow. Amen, amen. Just, just a reminder. We are studying the book of Revelation on Wednesday night. We are doing it in person as well. So come and join us. We're going to be at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. Come and join us. If you can't join us for whatever reason, do make sure you watch it on the whatever, the YouTube, the Facebook website, wherever you might find it. All right? Revelation is a great, stu a great study, great book. And it is nothing at all in there for us as God's children to be afraid of. Well, there's nothing in there for us to be afraid of. Because we ain't going to be there during this tribulation period. We're going to be exactly in heaven's kingdom. Let's go, to share, let's go and share with us somebody else about what God, God has done for us and for them. Go and tell them.